So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a warm welcome um, for that uh, early uh, evening debate uh, regarding decarbonization uh, of private sector or driven by private sector. Um, thanks a lot in the name of uh, UNFCCC and Roland Berger hosting uh, that meeting. And uh, it sounds like a pretty basic thing uh, to say contribution of private sector for decarbonization. But having a look at the world, let's say we are in a situation where there are more and more renationalization tendencies in business. So uh, every country trying to decouple and to protect its own uh, value chains on a, on a national level. And we are between key countries even in times of war. Uh, what is also not uh, making life easier in the private, private sector, because if the tremendous challenge we have ahead of us, let's say, in being successful in decarbonizing uh, industry production, in decarbonizing uh, energy production, scale effects would help a lot. We've seen with the cost decrease of renewables how much is possible by those things. Um, and I think what's for sure not the right uh, let's say, attitude uh, from a private sector is to look at the politicians and to say then they have to decide and then we can wait. So uh, what we did uh, as Roland Berger is uh, to do a study looking at the thousand assets that produce the most carbon dioxide in, on a global scale and having a look what it would mean to, let's say, decarbonize those assets and uh, then to, to, to turn around the overall uh, direction. They stand for 22% of uh, global carbon emission. And to start that uh, debate and that panel, we will have a short glimpse on that study we call a Global Carbon Restructuring Plan. And after that, and, and a warm welcome to uh, our guests on the podium um, that will be moderated uh, from our side. So it's first Dame Susan Rice, who is the chair of the Global Ethical Finance Initiative. Warm welcome to have you here. It's Miguel Lopez, the CEO of Thyssen Group, uh, mostly branded for German steel company, but I think the key core business is, uh, is, is more in other segments. There's Francois Dao, the vice president, Middle East and Africa of EDF. And there is Driss Barajo, Vice President uh, and Business Development uh, responsible of green hydrogen at Aquapower. So that is the podium we have. And uh, now as a short input, the study regarding uh, global rest uh, carbon restructuring from my colleague Martin. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, dear UNFCCC, dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to um, actually share some thoughts on what we believe could be a very effective and pragmatic um, global, global carbon restructuring plan. What is the problem if we talk about climate change? The problem is that we mostly talk about decreased temperature. Instead, we should probably talk much more about tons of CO2 to be avoided to get on a reasonable pathway. In our case, that is 24 gigatons until 2030. Now, the question is, what if we could really turn this around? What would it take? We have taken a closer look, and what's very clear is we would need to pull the biggest levers that we have at hand. It reminds me of the 80-20 principle. It's always just a few things that cause the majority of the result. How can we apply this to climate change? We need to go first and fast where the, where the emissions are actually happening. And that is on a plant level, as we call it, on an asset level. Now, if you look at the numbers, eight gigatons of 24 gigatons to be avoided, that is one third, just stems from 1,000 assets. These are the single large, largest em uh, emissioning assets. What's behind it? We have taken a closer look at each and every one of it, and what you find is about 80% of them are power-producing assets. 
about 20% of them are in the iron and steel business. If you look at it from a regional perspective, you find the majority of the single largest assets in China, in India, US, and Europe. Now, what are the solutions that we have at hand? It's very clear. We can swap the energy supply into renewables, into nuclear, that gives us, leaves us with 100% decarbonization, or we go into gas, leaves us with a 50% um, carbon footprint compared to uh, coal-fired power plants, and of course, we can apply carbon capture, which almost gets us to 100% reduction. Now, the key question is, what are the costs of decarbonization? We have applied that formula to every single asset and came up with 1,000 restructuring plans, if you print it, it's quite a book actually, um, for each and every asset. So we know exactly what to do and where to go. If you look at it from a portfolio perspective, the question is, what would it cost? That is a large number, 7.5 to 10.5 trillion US dollars. That is, a, that is a number with 12 zeros. I think it's useful to have this in mind because it puts per, into perspective all the pledges that, we're he, that we are hearing around COP. What we need is 10 by the power of 12 just to decarbonize the single largest emitters. Now the question is, which pathways are most cost effective? We have taken a closer look into the lifetime costs of these assets, that is CAPEX and the OPEX costs over the runtime of the, these assets. And what you see is that we need between 5 and 8.2 trillion US dollars to decarbonize on the left-hand side the power assets, and on the right-hand side the non-power assets, we would need to put about 2.2 million in carbon capture and storage to decarbonize the industrial plants. Now, is that a large number or a small number? We need perspective on it. If we take this amount of money and put it on an uh, annual perspective, we see it's about one-sixth of what we spend compared to R&D, COVID relief, and military spend. So is it doable? Yes, it certainly is doable. The question is, who can do it? Here, if we look at the regional challenge, and just, again, to put things into perspective, we have taken the total lifetime costs of this asset swap into perspective with the GDP of the regions. And what you can see already as a first glance is that China and India face quite a burden in terms of swapping their assets, whereas in Europe and in the US, it's quite doable if you look at the, at the strength of the economy compared to the challenge that we have decarbonizing the single largest emitters. Now, if we want the asset owners of today's assets to play a role in that, the question is, what do they need? They need profitability of their solutions, they need financeability of these solutions, and these solutions sort of have to match with the requirements of their communities, predominantly security of energy supply. First, let's talk about profitability. We have taken all the costs and looked at the megawatt hours produced, and what you find is, it's quite reasonable. It should be profitable in most markets. It is very clear that the Global East faces a challenge in competitiveness compared to the power prices today, but it should be quite doable. The real challenge is on the right-hand side. We need a CO2 pricing scheme in place in order to make carbon capture a business. That is not in place. Next question, financeability. Can asset owners of today play an active role here? We have taken the balance sheets of all asset owners that are behind these 1,000 assets and looked at the financial headroom with, from a classical perspective, putting their net debt capacity in uh, comparison to their profitability or to their profit levels. What we see is we do have about 2.2 trillion financial headroom from the current asset owners in place. So there is some headroom. Now the question is, is this enough to finance the capex that is necessary for these solutions? Here you see renewables, gas, nuclear, and CCS, and on the left-hand side, uh, colorful, you see the capex proportion of the total lifetime costs. And what you can easily see is having the 2.2 trillion in mind. Well, 
we need about four trillion in capex for renewable assets. That is about 50%. That is tough for the current asset owners. We need about four trillion as well for nuclear solutions. That's also uh, only about half. What they could finance are gas-fired solutions and CCS. This is as it stands. How is that financeability headroom of the asset owners spread across regions? Here again, you see China and India, from an asset owner perspective, are, face, are facing a financeability challenge, and that holds true for each asset class. In Europe and in the US, only if we would go 100% nuclear would, face a would be a challenge from an uh, asset owner balance sheet perspective. Now, summing this all up, what does it all mean? If you reconcile the analysis, we had five regions along with four pathways um, on how to decarbonize. We have looked in three dimensions, that is profitability, financeability, and effectiveness of CO2 reduction. What you see from the picture is China and India, from top to bottom, they face a challenge in financeability. Gas on the horizontal line is in itself not as effective from a, um, a CO2 reduction perspective. On top, gas is quite expensive right now in, uh, in Europe, um, making it a profitability challenge. Nuclear is also quite expensive in the US and in Europe. And CCS altogether faces a profitability issue that needs to be resolved with regard to regulation uh, and CO2 pricing schemes. What does it mean for, for us how to, how to navigate from a decision maker perspective uh, through this? From our perspective, we need a new form of collaboration between regions on a governmental level in coordination of pricing schemes uh, and also rethinking asset allocations between regions. We need a new form of collaboration on company level, um, best practice transfer, technology transfer, and so forth, because after all, all the asset owners of today's assets face the same technologi uh, technological challenge. And we need new concepts on the financing th uh, side of things, because headroom of balance sheets is not equally distributed, um, but the solution, need, or the solution needs heavy financing. So this, in a nutshell, um, as an opening for the discussion, very much looking forward to our uh, estimated, um, um, esteemed panelists. And um, yeah, handing back to you, Stefan. Okay, so uh, say uh, having a look at that uh, restructuring thoughts, we, we start uh, with the podium. So again, a warm welcome and thanks for participating at our debate. And uh, first part we are say, having in mind is really, let's say, uh, what can and should be the contribution of the private sector. And uh, let me start with Chris, um, you for Aqua Power, you have originated the green hydrogen business with Aqua. You are driving large scale projects, let's say, from visibility to really getting things done. Uh, in your direction, the first question according to the uh, latest World Energy Outlook, we need to triple renewable energy generation by 2030 11 gigawatt to achieve net zero at 2050. So uh, what do you see the role of the private sector? Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, so I think maybe just a little bit of history. Uh, so I think in terms of contribution from the private sector, I think I'm quite glad that today we're talking about uh, such a huge ramp up of uh, renewables. And I think that the, the uh, private sector did contribute to building up to that uh, vision for the simple reason that 
over the last 10 years, the drastic reduction in cost from renewables. I mean, yes, policy did contribute a lot, but as well, at the end, it's really the private sector that contributed in uh, delivering uh, lower and lower costs, uh, either through the scale-up on the manufacturing side, again, with the equipment suppliers, but as well with the contribution of the developers and really optimizing the projects to make them more and more comp uh, competitive to the point where today we are talking about uh, renewable power below $2 per kilowatt hour uh, in, uh, in this region, and I think on itself that is quite transformational uh, to support the vision of decarbonizing in such a, a, a short time frame. Now, uh, moving forward, uh, I think that uh, the, the key challenge that we have is no longer on price. I think it's, uh, it's uh, an issue of speed. Uh, how fast can we deploy in order to decarbonize? Uh, price is no longer an issue. I think with the level of prices we have renewable power, it is competitive with pretty much uh, anything. And, uh, and actually even the, what we call conventional solutions are actually only going the other direction. Uh, and I think that uh, what, what needs to be done is really uh, allow the private sector actually to implement at the speed it could, be, it could do. Uh, and I think I'm quite glad that uh, with the example of Saudi Arabia, I mean, while the government has set a target of uh, 59 gigawatt by 2030 when it comes to renewables only, I think that they have, they have seen that uh, uh, trying to regulate the, uh, the, the ramp up through conventional, I would say, government-driven kind of uh, uh, tenders uh, was not the solution. And that's why the program has been split in two components. One component that will follow that type of program for around 30% of the capacity. But then for other 70%, that is then on, on the basis of a partnership with the, uh, with the private sector, where there is a dedicated program, direct engagement with the private sectors, and figuring out what the private sector needs in order to deliver on that capacity and the right speed and to effectively get on those uh, next 42 gigawatt of renewables in a very short time frame uh, in the example of Saudi Arabia. So. Okay, Chris, thanks a lot. So uh, also having a link to the Middle East, uh, shift to Badao. If we calculate it right, you're responsible in the Middle East and Africa region for a portfolio of over 4,000 megawatt uh, of wind and solar energies. And uh, let's say the we had that in the pre-debate, the geopolitical game will shift a little between regions and countries. So uh, also from an EDF perspective, will the Middle East Africa, the center, not only in the fossil fuels, but also for the new, for the next generation of energy production of the world? How do you see the perspective and what will be the contribution of the private sector? Sure, uh, allowing, allow me just before, uh, to, to clarify one thing, which is who is the EDF? We are French utility company. And just one figure, out of the uh, 430 terawatt hour that we are supplying in 2022, 90% of our electricity is net zero carbon. So, of course, it's mainly from our nuclear plants, as well as from renewables, hydropower, solar, and wind. And this is where I am in, in charge of mid, uh, Middle East and Africa. You're right, as of today, our asset in this region is five gigawatts, actually. We have added a few things last week. Thank you. Uh, and we see this uh, uh, growth has been quite an acceleration the last few years, only a few years. And we see clearly a lot of uh, initiatives as well as target set up by of course, we have talked about Saudi Arabia, and this is, is right, but as well as UAE, where we see a further acceleration. Of course, we are happy to hear these last few days the trouble up in renewables, which will bring only a partial solution. Yes, we are part of it, so we are typically in the uh, PPP, private partnership, private public partnership, where we develop, we build, and we operate, and we see it a big growth where renewable must, must absolutely bring these production, power production of CO2 down and further down as much as possible, particularly in this region. Thanks a lot. So we make a little shift and in the presentation of my colleague, we had the energy producing assets and we had the non-energy producing assets. So uh, Mr. Miguel Lopez, uh, the CEO of ThyssenKrupp, uh, is responsible for some of the non-energy producing assets. But uh, 
two questions. So first, do you believe that, let's say, the decarbonization of the historical assets should be done in the same entity as the decarbonization? I think you are going a little in a different direction. That is, uh, that is uh, question one. And so do you, do you believe that those uh, business should be kept together in the future, or do you go for in, an, in, in a different direction? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, congratulations to the to the study. Very um, comprehensive, and and I like the asset approach because I'm one of the thousand assets. Um, and um, you know, the 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 only thing that uh, that we probably need to um, take a look is to the trillions that you were uh, the, where you where you said the seven point five to ten point five. To me, it's a little bit higher. But um, I give you one example. Um, uh, from uh, our steel business. Uh, we are in the steel business in um, uh, Germany uh, and we are responsible for 2.5% of the complete CO2 emissions in Germany. So we are one of the biggest um, assets to get decarbonized. We started the program and we, uh, we will install, we started already uh, this year, we will install uh, the first DRI, this is a direct reduction plant uh, replacing one blast furnace, um, 2.5 uh, million tons of steel. And this investment for this DRI plant is uh, gross 3 billion. Um, we, um, fortunately, we are in very good um, cooperation with the German government and got um, a 2 billion uh, support um, the two billion support, I don't call it subsidy because it's a price risk mitigation um, um, mechanism and it's to clearly put one third of blue hydrogen and two third of, uh, two third of green hydrogen for the first 10 years, 2028 to 2038. So it is a, a big, big um, uh, program that we are running there, big, big investment and uh, this is one of the, uh, obviously, of the challenges, but I also call us the, the uh, most uh, active climate activists because of this large project um, to, be, to be done. On the other hand, uh, there are more blast furnaces, and there we will sh be sure taking also decisions, but it might not be uh, financeable to replace all of them uh, by uh, DRIs. Uh, so that's a, that's, a, that's a big challenge. Um, only to close, it is very important to get the infrastructure. I think this is clear for everyone. We need to sort the infrastructure out now to organize the infrastructure, which is, of course, grid, but also hydrogen. And this is what we are, what we are in, in the phase of doing it in the next uh, couple of months to organize how to get the 140,000 tons of hydrogen a year um, in a competitive, with a competitive price from places where we have cheap energy, renewable energy, to Germany. Okay, now having had the industry examples, we have, let's say, the wise dame, Susan Weiss, uh, let's say, uh, heading or chairing the Global Ethical Finance Initiative. Let's say that is trying to curate independent conversations among financial services and financing will be a topic to get all those things done. So uh, if we take some figures, if we take the emerging countries, they needed per year 1.7 trillion. Actually, the yearly investments are in the dimension of 100. So do you see ways of, uh, of, uh, of uh, getting that triggered better? Question one, question two. Do you believe or do you prefer to finance, let's say, new companies that build up the new business or do you prefer to, uh, let's say, give the money to the old companies to uh, organize their turnaround? So what's your perspective on those two questions? So that, so the reason we're smiling is that there was an iPad at the back saying, hold the mic closer to your yeah, mouth. Yeah, I, so. I, I ignored it permanently, <laughs> but I, I hope in that room you can here we nevertheless, it, yeah. it's a small room and normally my voice should fit, but uh, so, I, I, I'll, I'll try to improve, yeah? Okay. So, so let me answer your question in a way that you didn't quite 
ask it, if that's okay. It's so, fine. Um, uh, two, two things about, about finance. Um, one of them is, I don't think it's an either or, you know, new companies, old companies, established companies or not. Uh, I think different companies adapt and change over time in different ways. It depends where they start uh, and what the, um, you know, where they're, where they're, where they're in intending to go. Um, an important thing about finance is finance alone from a, from a financial investor um, isn't enough. It needs to be um, sort of dealt with in an environment. So if the company is in a country, or Germany, or France, or other many countries, um, you need an, a legislative, a regulatory environment that actually allows the company, new or established, to use the finance in a way that will be really effective. It's an interesting thing when you think about uh, climate finance in the private sector. So I'm, you know, my background is private sector, and, and I've worked in all three sectors, but I'm a big believer in the uh, innovation and the um, strength and, 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 and um, the power, if you will, in, the, in a good sense, of private sector companies. But we compete. Um, so actually, if, if you know, we get some finance in my company, then we want to do things that others aren't. We want to get there faster. Uh, so, so that's one part of the answer is this is an issue sometimes in life where you have to go beyond competition in the private sector sense and you actually have to see what are the solutions and what can we learn from each other and share from each other. So that's, uh, that's part of it. Now the other part of it is if you're a financial investor, um, that's fine. You'll be talking to companies that are doing some new things, uh, some innovative technologies I chair. A, a water company, an infrastructure water company in Scotland, and uh, we're experimenting with um, green cement, green steel, with it, you know lots of things. Water sector is one of the biggest emitters, not a plant, but the sector around the world because we have so many treatment plants, uh, and and so so we can we can sort of operate on the what I like to call the frontier. We can operate and, and try and experiment and change while we're doing today's job, we still need to think about tomorrow. Um, financial, financial investors may well uh, say that's fine um, and you know we'll go with that. Um, but financial regulators, so the, the, the financial investors are also themselves private sector entities and they're regulated and the regulation, I keep saying this because I've worked on that side as well, um, the regulation looks at yesterday and today and it doesn't operate very much on that frontier and you need an alignment there. So um, there are a lot of things that need to happen. You need, um, I think in particular, hybrid approaches to finance. You need some public sector finance that gets in at the start sometimes to make the rest of the private sector finance work. Um, there are some recently some uh, sovereign sustainable bonds which don't restrict where the money is used within a, within a given place. There are, are lots of ways to be creative about finance um, and it, it's not as simple as either or, so forgive me. <laughs> okay, so I, I, you, you, you in, a, in a very charming way redefined my <laughs> question, so uh, to, to uh, come back to, to Francois Dao. So uh, the, uh, having a look, you were historically more in the electron business. And uh, if I look uh, at uh, Mr. Lopez, uh, the molecule business will be a more and more uh, elementary part of where, let's say, the future goes to. So uh, how would you describe the transformation from classically coming from the electrons going now in direction of hydrogen and ammonia and all those things? Sure. Uh, our world was quite simple not long ago. <laughs> Just how to be, okay, of course, we innovate in panel, PV panels to make it bifacial, so we improve the efficiency. Uh, wind turbines are higher and higher in order to get uh, more generation. Two years ago, actually, the EDF group has fixed the purpose of the company being to build the net zero future energy. Of course, by the carbonation. We'll, I will definitely talk about this later on, about the industries. But the other thing is the future energy, we have no doubt about it, and particularly when we are in this region, 
of Middle East and to some extent North Africa, green hydrogen or green and or green ammonia are part of the future energy, no doubt about it. We have uh, exceptional natural resources. Solar, you, you have been facing all day long. Wind as well in some places, north of, uh, mid, uh, of uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman. Uh, we have no issue about land. We have access to sea. So that means that we are here in this region, an exceptional place to produce large quantity of green, this for us, green hydrogen ammonia for export to countries, and we can name them, they, they are clearly known, Europe, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, 10 million <laughs> tonne of hydrogen needed by 2030, which is 50 to 60 million tonne per year of ammonia. So right now, we, can, we need to ship it in ammonia form rather than hydrogen. And then we have uh, in Asia, Japan and Korea, who are in major need of green ammonia, particularly for their uh, co-firing in the coal power plant, which is another way to decarbonate. So it's huge demand. We can't stop just at our electron. We know that the answer, we need to go further to hydrogen electrolyzer, to go the further down to ammonia, which is the Haber-Bosch process. These are next great step for us, but right now, and I believe personally, in the next five to 10 years, it's a must for us, energy company, to go to the whole supply chain in order to make this project happen. And then, and then definitely, the, the world may go back to uh, energy people and then molecule people. But for right now, to make this project bankable, technically feasible, we have to go through the whole process. Thanks a lot. So. Uh we have seen that the global footprint of energy production and also of industry production, let's say the value change, for example, of steel production will change significant between regions following energy prices, following availability of hydrogen. Uh, Susan Rice, you see from a financing perspective in that, uh, let's say, defining the game in a new way and breaking up classical, let's say, uh, rules of the game in energy production and also in many industries that have to be decarbonized. Is that an upside or a downside for gaining speed? <laughs> so I think, I think it's an upside because I, I like this notion of disrupting and you know, making change happen in, in, in that sense. But I, I think also about um, my organization, Jeffy, has done a lot of work for some years uh, between the global north and the global south and getting finance um, for these purposes out there. And uh, what we need to be really thoughtful about, um, and I know all of the thousand um, assets are mostly in the global north, I don't know, but I would guess all maybe. Uh, uh, but the point is that we have to decarbonize everywhere. Uh, and But w we make a mistake if we just assume our approach and our way of doing it is going to work everywhere else. So um, I think that there needs to be a kind of creative thinking, a different approach. Uh, a, an African country which has a, a coal-fired plant that employs lots of people, if they close that down tomorrow with all the money in the world, those people are out of jobs, the economy suffers, they're no closer. Uh, so um, I guess the way I think about it is from the perspective of what are we trying to achieve at the end of the day, and that is, um, decarbonization everywhere uh, and that's going to take a lot of different approaches thanks a lot so we just as a general rule here if there are questions from you participating here in the meeting please raise hands and uh, we will uh, let's say take your questions in between we had now a short look at let's say where private companies and private sector investment stands now that we have described that uh, there has to be a scale up and Dris Barajo, I think one of the most impressive examples of scaling up uh, is Aqua. So uh, in the last 12 months, if I'm right, perhaps you surpassed already our figures as uh, it was the case with Mr. Dow. Uh, so 10 major projects were closed with a uh, volume of over 14 billion US dollar. Uh, one of them is the Neon Green Hydrogen Project where you're investing significantly 
uh, just uh, to challenge your, let's say, business logic behind that, is a demand for the for the hydrogen you produce secured, or or where do you stand on that? Because it's always the first that moves, takes the risks, and uh, let's say uh, to satisfy the demand, and vice versa. So. Uh, just to no. enlighten us a little in that dimension. No, th thanks, uh, thanks for that. So indeed, I mean, uh, we're very fortunate in the uh, less than 20 years of our existence to grow to uh, almost like a 53 gigawatt company, out of which uh, uh, with more than 45% uh, is renewable already today. And as you mentioned, uh, today we are, we are blessed to have the first uh, green hydrogen project under construction. So it's roughly uh, 210,000 tons of green hydrogen per year that will be produced starting from end of 2026 and will be shipped in the form of uh, ammonia. Uh, now, I think it's in terms of uh, market. So I think that uh, the way we have structured the project uh, is that, I mean, uh, we are uh, three partners. And out of this partnership, of course, there is always like uh, different contributions. But I think in this specific project, we have to recognize uh, the contribution of our partner, Air Products, who have uh, effectively, beyond being a, a co-sponsor, they are as well the offtaker uh, for the entire volume of this, uh, of this project. Uh, now, of course, uh, this uh, as part of the project financing, because this project was uh, financed on a non-recourse uh, project uh, basis. Uh, of course, there was very interesting discussions with our lenders as to, okay, what happens next? Okay, it's okay. We can always take a view about uh, Air Products balance sheet, but uh, I think that's not sufficient. I think we need to see if there is a market for that uh, for that project. And I believe that I think that the the strategy that Air Products has announced uh, publicly. Uh, the volumes involved with the project, and just to put things into perspective, uh, this project is uh, the equivalent fuel consumption of uh, 20,000 buses. How big is that? It's a drop in the ocean. So uh, frankly, even if the market does not pick up to the entire scale that everybody is uh, thinking about, these first 20,000 buses, we are pretty confident that will be placed. Uh, the product is uh, competitive against alternatives uh, in many different instances. And, uh, and I think that's one of the examples where I think that, again, allowing the private sector to take a view as to where it makes the best sense to allocate capital uh, is the way to as well uh, accelerate. And I think that uh, one of the questions and around uh, how, do we, uh, what, uh, how do we allow the, uh, the private sector effectively to, to operate, I think the private sector is usually always better placed than the public sector to allocate capital to the most effectively, to the highest return investment. Uh, and based on that uh, effectively value proposition, I think it should not be the governments dictating where decarbonization should be effectively uh, uh, driven. Uh, at the end, it's rather the private sector that should be deciding what is the lowest cost of uh, abatement of CO2 uh, in their individual businesses. And, but the problem is that the only way to drive that is to have a carbon market at the end. Because of course, I mean, there is no f to, we need some form of regulation to create the incentive and the market to start operating. But as soon as you see that, of course, naturally, I think uh, there are what, what, is, what are obvious solutions today may not be suitable, and you will see new solutions uh, effectively emerging. Uh, hydrogen is a great tool. I mean, again, I mean, we are, we are uh, very bullish about it. We'll be investing a lot and, uh, to drive the transition. It doesn't mean that green hydrogen will be systematically the best solution to decarbonize many, uh, in many instances. I think we need to look at the cost per uh, a ton of CO2 abated. Uh, there are many other solutions uh, through direct electrification, through uh, other means as well, uh, looking at efficiency, looking at the actual asset itself. Uh, so I think that the, uh, there is no solution for all. Uh, but again, uh, the private sector, in order to play its role, they need to have just the rules of the game that are well defined. And after that, just allow them to do what uh, the private sector does best, just to allocate this uh, big pile of capital where it will be uh, will be having the biggest impact, actually. Just to change sides directly, so Mr. Lopez, uh, uh, ThyssenKrupp is in primary steel, so it's direct reduction, not, uh, let's say, uh, secondary steel, and uh, you are doing one of the biggest investments in uh, green uh, hydrogen-based steel production. Uh, just to, to look at the other side, uh, where does the hydrogen economy stand in Germany and Europe, and uh, of what does it need to really make your business? You said one third blue and, and two third uh, green hydrogen. Is that on the way, or is it a limiting factor to do the fundamental shift you, you are organizing? So, um, <clears throat> indeed, it is, um, it is our role, so Tusen Group's role um, in the green transformation to be 
um, the front runner in, in Germany for the hydrogen uh, economy because of, simply of the of the uh, vast amount um, of um, of hydrogen that we need, 140,000 tons a year. And uh, Tris, you were talking about that Neom is providing 210,000, right? So you can imagine you can imagine what um, what what is the dimension that we would need as soon as we start the the, the hydrogen economy in in Germany. What are the dimensions of Neoms that we that we need? And this is. This is something, uh, of course, uh, where we are working not only on the on the steel side, together with H2Med, together with uh, H2Steel, uh, together with our partners uh, here and uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, it's also a challenge in terms of uh, getting uh, the number of hydro uh, uh, of uh, electrolyzers done. They're getting what you said before, all the uh, ammonia plants. So the the producers of ammonia plants right now. Uh, are not used to scale, so because we are one of the uh, main players in the world for that. So the green transformation is happening in ThyssenKrupp also on the other side as a technology provider where we have um, uh, created uh, October 1st the, the new uh, segment which is uh, decarbonizing decarbon technologies where we have exactly Nucero with the electrolyzers, we have the um, uh, Ude with all the ammonia, so green chemicals and uh, then uh, you mentioned before cement. Cement is producing eight to ten percent of the global CO2 emissions. So we have um, uh, Polisius as a decarbonizing company for the cement industry. We have built uh, 800 of 2,300 um, cement plants in the world. 800 we built. So we know exactly how how to do that, um, and I have there also uh, um, a great. Yeah, task and challenge in front of us, and finally the bearings for the wind industry. So um, we should not forget. It's not only that's the reason why all these elements play into this this um, this ramp up, uh, a significant ramp up of the hydrogen economy. It's not only it's not only the off taker. It's not only the grid. It's the equipment manufacturers, and there are challenges, but also tremendous uh, opportunities that uh, should be also highlighted. Okay, thanks a lot. So, uh, Mr. Daos, Susan Rice was uh, was mentioning that we somehow in the Western countries we create some first mover things that uh, that uh, could be transferred to the world to look at a little at, at it from a little different angle. So, I, I'm sometimes not so sure if regarding H2 infrastructure, if regarding development of grids. Uh, the Western countries are the first movers. So is, let's say, for the historical Western countries something we can learn from Middle East and Africa to speed up the process in these, let's say, infrastructural and, and, uh, and let's say, surrounding conditions to, to make the decarbonization a success? I think definitely technology will come from the, uh, from the West, definitely. Uh, now, from the Middle East and Africa, we, it's not true everywhere. There are m major countries which are setting up regulations, policy, long-term view, and to me that's the most important, in order to get uh, investors or developers like us to be able to have a long-term view and therefore to facil facilitate our investment. And we always go back to technology. We are a lot of engineers, and most of us, I'm sure, in this room are engineers. We are designed to fix solutions and to find solutions. I'm not worried about this. What we, the problem we, we are facing most of the time is the time, is the long term view. Uh, and uh, allow me to give an example of what we, are, what we have, uh, have, have been developed in terms of partnership in South Africa. Uh, we are not in molecule, so again, we, like, we love challenge. So we have a joint venture with Anglo-American, which is a mining company, one of the top five mining companies, where we are together helping this mining industry to decarbonize by 2030 all their mines in South Africa and nearby countries as Namibia and Zimbabwe. So it's a three gigawatt of renewable program 
which are being developed hand in hand with people who have nothing to do with our world of electrons, with whom I have no idea how they, they are producing their product, how they mine. But yes, we sometimes need to sit together, work out a long-term plan of five years, where thinking what will be able to have them to be net zero by 2030. That's the few things, it's not, well, it's, it's a large program, it's a large initiative, but it is very much needed. We must go out of the box in order to have this moving forward. And of course, hydrogen, and you, you're right, uh, is part of it. There will be hydrogen projects in South Africa. There are issues about the grids. We know about it, the network needs to be fixed. I was a bit earlier with some ESCOM people and another panel, they know this issue. Uh, again, another problem we have is time, time to fix it. And uh, the transition plan or the fight against climate change uh, doesn't have time to do it, to wait for it. Thanks a lot. Just to, to come back a little to the study and for the financial dimension. Susan Rice, so we've seen that in uh, emerging markets, also where you have a lot of people locally, meaning China and India, to transform the huge capacity they have built in, in, in coal power stations and whatever, to transform that will effort uh, enormous financial, uh, financial amounts to, to get that thing changed. Do you have a special recipe how we handle that key challenge on a global dimension? It's a really good and really important question because some of these very large countries are building new coal-fired plants, um, not so much to add capacity, but because the old ones are coming off. Um, they're, they're failing and they, they, don't, they can't do anything else but keep building until they transition. I guess what I would say to that, again, is a slightly off-piste answer. Um, it, sorry. <laughs> it seems to be your style to a certain extent. Is um, we shouldn't well, we should remind ourselves what parts of the world have done when they have been less well-developed. So if you look at parts of India that never had an electricity grid, that never had wires and pylons and so forth, um, there are other ways to go about helping them electrify. Um, so very small, high, very small scale hydro dams um, actually create electricity much more locally. If you look at the development of mobile uh, technology in parts of Africa, um, they didn't start um, with the kind of telephone that I was brought up with, you know, that sat on the table and I said hello and so on. They didn't start there. They started at the fourth generation of telephones. They went right to mobile telephones. So I don't have the answer, but I think we need to be open-minded about the... Um, willingness of, of countries to, um, to make some of the right moves, um, uh, but in a different way, in a different time frame than, than many of us have done. Okay, so you see a certain hope for a leapfrog thing to... Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Well, I see hope in almost everything. Sorry, that's just my yeah, infirmity. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps in these times, that's a basic attitude that it can be helpful, so let's see. Are there questions from the participants here? I would have a question. We are, we are, we are lucky to have the four of you representing different aspects of the private sector, while uh, somewhere else in the blue zone there are governments discussing their national objectives and financing and so forth. Do you think governments do enough uh, to help you abate CO2 emissions of your own industry or, or your, your clients or your, your partners? Because sometimes it's simple a matter of having that renewable energy uh, available or being able to finance a project uh, which returns are not uh, fine because, because CO2 price is not high enough. Or, so what's, what's your view on this? What, are going fast enough and doing enough? So short answer from everybody. You start, Mr. Dow. Well, I'm sure that we all read before the COP that we don't expect much from this COP again. Uh, no, no, I, I do believe. I do believe that uh, from private sector, and you have seen, I'm sure that you have seen the last, from the first day, a certain number of initiatives, uh, commitment, engagement have been uh, signed or at least advocated by a lot of industry, 
uh, triple up in, in, in nuclear, triple up in renewables, all these are pushing up. Of course, we need, I see, uh, governments to set up the, 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 the roadmap, regulations, clear view, so that we can move forward. But there are many more things, I'm sure, about it. But I see things, uh, two things, government and private sector being somehow closer and closer to the same target, of course. Mr. Lopez? Well, it, it depends on the government, you know, but um, the, 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 if, you, if you look to the pure facts, and uh, we need, for example, we need 1,000 gigawatts of installments of uh, renewable energy to get our targets done. Last year, how much did we install? 300. So we are already 700 one year behind the target. This is a huge, huge um, failure. And that's the reason why I would think the answer to this one is uh, whatever we have done until now, it needs to be completely treated differently. And I will only mention one thing, which is population, government, it's permits. The permits many times is not a problem that the government is not willing to give the permit. It's the population in this area they don't want. So we, should, we, cannot, we cannot somehow make governments responsible for everything. In terms of installment of, um, of renewable energy, it's the major factor is population first. Second, regulation, and third, the investment and financeability. That would be my, this, this is only a, a thing for a complete panel, this question only. But thank you for the question. Susan. Yeah, so I think governments can do two things. Um, one of them is actually to set aggressive ambitions. Uh, not so much the absolute target, but ambitions, because for the private sector anyway, I think that a lot of companies subscribe to these when they come, and then others do over time because their pals are all subscribing to it. So I think that's one thing. The other thing is that governments have uh, certain financial levers that they control, sort of taxes and customs and excise and, and, and those kinds of matters. So I very recently became chair of an organization that's not yet formed called in Scotland called the Fourth Green Freeport. So this is a freeport. Lots of country, countries have them. In Scotland, this will be green focused. Um, and you know, the financial uh, contribution from government isn't just a grant, it's um, relaxation of customs and excise, it's um, keeping um, taxes that businesses in a certain prescribed area pay, keeping them locally so that they will be reinvested in that area. Um, there's a, just a, a lot of creative work that governments can do and um, I guess I would close with something that I uh, always uh, say because I'm so interested in it. When you have a place-based approach, as a freeport would be, so this is you know 17 square miles, if you will, um, you tend to engage everybody who's there, and that starts with the population. Your your point is absolutely right, um, but because it's local and it's the local authorities and it's the universities, it's it's the businesses. Uh, because they're all there and operating, and that's a better approach at times. Okay, so having a look at the time, and we are streaming in parallel, so we should keep the time window address. You answered this question, and a, one final question to all of you, and we make it the other way around, and not to go for the public or for the political side, but uh, to go for innovation and private sector. If you had one wish for an innovation of decarbonization, which one would that be after answering the public sector question? The other ones have more time to think okay. about the question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, okay, so uh, as far as the public sector is concerned, or governments, uh, what I guess uh, the answer is always nuanced. Uh, you always have uh, the uh, good students and the bad students. Uh, amongst the bad students, I would say that. Uh, uh, an excess of bureaucracy and the lack of bold decisions and uh, bold targets as well tend to be really uh, what is pulling the brakes on decarbonization. I mean, there are many cases where uh, you would have uh, initiatives that are actually at a uh, negative 
cost of carbon displacement uh, because simply the uh, the new solution is uh, is cheaper than what we have before. And uh, but the problem is that it requires effectively displacing the status quo of whatever is uh, uh, already existing. But that uh, the requires bold decisions, and usually it takes time and or just doesn't happen. So that's maybe one of the failures. Uh, on the flip side, you have as well the good students and. Uh, when I mentioned Saudi Arabia, uh, that's uh, one of them. But there is other, very other, uh, very uh, interesting example as well. Uh, we're in a country in Uzbekistan, actually, uh, where the country is on track to decarbonize its power sector by 60 percent by in 2030. So it's a bit of a kind of an unusual uh, kind of uh, case people would not expect, but uh, simply because of the uh, bold decisions and uh, of the of the government, really, and that comes all the way from the president himself and all of his government, and as well the methodology that has been adopted again in relation to how to tackle the decarbonization, which is again uh, having a small component of, uh, of uh, I would say, government tendered uh, procurement, but as well more of a, uh, I would say, uh, uh, more closer to the private sector engagement in, uh, into a program, you get effectively a rollout of capacity that is uh, effectively goes very fast. And as soon as you have the program, actually, you end up having a Capacity is never an issue in terms of uh, industrial capacity. Financing is not an issue, actually. Uh, well, like is, uh, there is plenty of money to support this kind of program. So, and the, the magic happens, basically. Uh, okay. Yes. Coming for the round for the wish, you wish for an innovation in decarbonization you would be pleased to have tomorrow. <laughs> so, m the real issue here, if you have a finance hat, is. There's plenty of money. There are lots of projects of all different sorts. It's getting the money to the projects. Um, and so my wish would be that we opened um, those pathways a little more effectively and just got the money there. The there are lots of ways to do it. Matching yeah. mechanism. Yeah. Mr. Lopez? Well, um, technology is already invented. Uh, uh, it's about scaling up and reducing cost. That's the reason why I would um, play Susan now and make another wish, um, rather than your question. C can I? It's fine. <laughs> it, 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 it's he perfect. was doing that the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, uh, my wish would be that we get um, that we get a plan together to get this thousand gigawatt uh, of renewable energy installed every year in order to make our plans. That my that's my real wish. Okay, thanks a lot. Francois? Being the last one, so I have two wishes. Okay. <laughs> uh, just, we always wish, and it's Christmas time very soon, we always wish for something we don't have. And uh, actually, in decommunation in the fight that we are all facing right now, we have everything human resources, technology, uh, financing, despite what I heard, but I'm sure, I'm, uh, believe me, there are plenty of monies. Uh, when your project is, is solid or robust enough in order to uh, deploy all these projects. But one thing we do not have, and that I don't have, and you won't have, and that you, we can wish anything that we will never get it, is time. And that's my other wish. Uh, somehow I think carbon price is something which need to eventually be fixed somehow and agreed all among us in order to make uh, to to make it something really working in terms of investment, in terms of uh, in, yeah, investment and deployment in order, in order to decarbonize. And to me, the simplest way is the carbon price. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, so uh, I think it was not only wishful thinking. I think we felt from that podium a lot of energy, and I'd say 70% of the things can be fixed by the private sector. Yeah is needed ambition and some stable regulation to uh, get things uh, to get things done from the from the you just need the down payment yeah <laughs> the down payment okay so that is that the classical solution we are not so sure if that is the best but let's see and um, thanks a lot for the, to the panelists for participating thanks a lot to all of you for joining that meeting and uh, Hopefully, let's say in the upcoming hours, there will be some interesting debates with some of the members of the podium and, and between you, uh, let's say, regarding private sector contribution to decarbonize. And thanks a lot for being here.